And the reason is my interest is in the social elements of these issues. So I'm not interested, I'm not an expert in prenatal health. I'm not an interested, I'm not an expert in um, uh, ecological health. I'm not an expert in any of those things. What my expertise is in communication processes and social processes and understanding human behavior change. Hit that button, go at it. Thank you. Yep. So I want to start out talking about social norms, which is going to be our focus today with a little story. And I'm, I called it Tuck's House because I thought everybody would think of Coach Mel Tucker, the Michigan State's coach, but it has absolutely nothing to do with Mel Tucker, but I kind of like saying like Tuck's House, you know, all those signs that we have around the stadium now. But what I'm really talking about is my friend, a woman named Tucker. And um, let's see, this was June 2020. Okay, so you think back to June 2020 and kind of what was going on in June 2020. Most of us probably don't want to remember that, but we were in the sort of young stages of a pandemic, right, as a country. And my friend Tuck, her very only son, the apple of her eye, was graduating from high school, and she decided that she would have a graduation party. And because she's such a close family friend, I agonized over this. How can I not go to the graduation party for my best family friend, her only son, etc.? So she sent out the invitation and had all these uh, precautions in place. We'll have hand sanitizer, people can wear masks, all the things, right? And so I read that and I was like, okay, I can't miss this. So I put my kids in the car, I trucked to Tuck's house. I, all the way there, because I study human behavior, I talked to my kids. I'm like, okay, listen, we're gonna walk into this place. We are going to have masks on. We are going to keep distant from people. We might be the only people in the room doing this, but we're going to do this, okay? So I just want, and I was on and on, like preparing my teenage kids, right? Mm -hmm. Preparing my teenage kids to be like the awkward kids in the room, okay? Could happen. What I didn't anticipate is how I was going to feel, right? depending on what happened, right? Or kind of how to navigate the whole social situation, right? So we put our masks on, we get out of the car, we walk up to the house, we open the door and there's this giant room full of people, no masks, everybody's close talking like this, like right in each other's faces. <laughs> we come in with our little mask on, very uptight, very nervous, afraid to interact with people, despite having this kind of, pep talk with each other about what to do. Well, I ask you the question, what do you think we did? Masks Took the masks off. Anybody else want to guess? Keep going. What do you think we did? Sorry, what? Turned around and went back. Basically, yes. Okay, so what we did, we stayed for a couple minutes. We had some super awkward conversations where we're like the masked one and everybody's looking at us. Right. And so and, and just feeling between feeling fear over COVID and being anxious about being standing out socially in this situation, we hightailed it out of there. OK, we couldn't we didn't stay very long. It was a total bomb. Right. And the reason I tell this story was because probably many of you have had this kind of interaction as well sometime over the last two years. And also it exemplifies the power of social norms, which is the topic for today. It, it exemplifies two things. One is what we call descriptive norms. This is what you see people doing around you. We looked around and we saw literally nobody else doing the thing that we were doing, right? So right there, that's a cue that like, you don't fit in, right? That also signaled to us what's called injunctive norms. This is the idea that of what people believe is the right thing to do, right? What was signaled to us in that room was, none of these people think this is important, this isn't the right thing to do, doesn't matter if you're protecting yourself or not, right? So I, I think this is, you know, just wanted to tell this story to kind of get us rolling on this topic of social norms. So um, our interest in social norms is on a couple of big issues. First of all, how is normative information communicated, right? How do we learn about social norms? Do people talk to each other about what's the normative thing to do? What's the right thing to do in these situations, et cetera? Um, we're also interested in learning more about when we're likely to be susceptible to social norms. Many of you have heard of the words peer pressure, right? That's kind of a classic case. It's a 
type of, of, of social norm, the idea that kids are particular, particularly susceptible to peer pressure, right? We're interested in identifying those conditions, cases, times, et cetera, when people are most likely to be susceptible to social norms. We're also interested in figuring out how social norms evolve over time and the role of communication in that process, right? So what we know is, we know they do evolve over time. And some of our research has kind of documented how that happens, right? If you think about the course of the COVID pandemic, right? Sorry to go back to this again. I'll try not to do it all the time. Um, but how much we've seen things change in terms of, you know, Day, early days when nobody was wearing masks to a point where everybody was wearing masks in, in many of our social myths to the, to the next stage and nobody would get close to each other, et cetera, to the next stage where now people are mixed. Some people are wearing masks, some people aren't, right? So we've seen that kind of norm for that particular behavior evolve just over the last um, couple of years, right? So we're interested in this evolution question. And then the last point here, and this is where I'm gonna spend my time today, we're interested in how norms and behavioral decisions are changed through what I say interventions. And interventions might be a communication campaign. It might be um, uh, an influencer campaign of some kind. It might be um, a monetary intervention where you're paying people to uptake a behavior and that can shape social norms. And that's what I'm going to talk about particularly is social norms and financial incentives and how those work together to shape our decisions. This mouse and I have issues. I'm just going to say it. I might need some help here. Can you just put it <laughs> forward? I don't, oh, here we go. Okay, there, there you go. Um, okay, so let me launch into this social norms and financial incentives just a little bit. Um, so first I start out with kind of like, so what? Like, who cares? So I have to persuade you that this might be an interesting topic. Um, so I've mentioned several times, one thing we know is that social norms shape what people decide to do. What that means is sometimes we look to other people to make a decision about how to act. It might be we look around the room and decide, oh, nobody's wearing a mask. I think I'll take mine off, right? Or it might be um, that we look around, we talk to our family members and we see, oh, they really care about this topic that makes me care about it more as well, right? So we know, and it makes me act based on the, that care for that issue, okay? So social norms shape the decisions that we make. Um, relatedly, we know that financial incentives are used very regularly to promote good behaviors, okay? For sure, they're used to promote work, for example, right? We use financial incentives to get people to work, to work harder, et cetera. But what we're interested in our, in our research is how money is used to promote um, pro-social behaviors, health behaviors, environmental behaviors, those types of things. And we know that all over the world, money is being used as basically a development tool, right? So um, there are programs to pay people to get their children vaccinated. There are programs to pay people to plant trees in communities. There are programs to pay people to recycle their garbage, recycle their waste, et cetera. Um, those are a very common form of development aid, right, is paying people to engage in these kind of pro-social actions. So if you take like recycling in your community, how many of us recycle, how many of us recycle our waste? Okay. Um, how many of us think recycling our waste is important, the important thing to do, the right thing to do, right? So that's our descriptive norm and our injunctive norm, both those things, right? How many times have you gone out on recycling day and driven around and noticed, wait, why doesn't everybody have their bins out, okay? So even though in East Lansing, there's lots of people who think recycling is important, there's lots of people who do recycle, there's still lots of people who don't do it, okay? So let's just say I'm a nonprofit organization who wants to promote recycling. So one thing I might decide to do is start paying people some sort of special bonus every time they put their cart out to the corner, okay? As a way to promote recycling, okay? So I, I, I start doing this and what I see is recycling just goes through the roof. Like suddenly everybody in East Lansing recycles. Oh, amazing, right? The next point is money doesn't last forever. Well, turns out my nonprofit loses its grant. I can't continue to pay people to recycle. So I have to end my payment program. Okay. What we saw prior to that payment program was lots of us thought recycling was important. Lots of us did it, but not everybody. 
But once we started paying people, everybody did it. So what happens, do you think, when we remove that incentive? What happens to people? What could happen to society? What could happen to norms? I think they would continue. Some people say they'd stop doing it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, stop doing it. You think they would continue? So why do you think that? I think, I think you get into the habit. Habit. And that already kind of would be rewarded. Now you can reward yourself. So no. Okay. No, these are all plausible things that can happen, right? So, um, so anybody else think anything else that could happen? Might happen. Yeah. Some will drop off because I haven't really internalized it. This man's a social scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So because you've got this external force that is driving behavior, there's a potential that the word in the uh, the literature is that incentive can crowd out other motivations for doing things. Okay. So once you start paying people to do something, what can happen is if they had other good motivations before, that money gets in the way. And actually, there's a great study that was done in child care centers where they had this problem with people not showing up on time to pick up their kids. So they thought, I, here's what we'll do. We'll start charging them when they're late. Okay. So they were like, this is brilliant, right? So what happened is they said, okay, if you're late to pick up your kids, we're going to charge you an extra $10 for every minute that I'm just making up those numbers, every five minutes that you're late. Okay. So they thought this will solve it. No, what they saw instead was it used to be people were like, oh, I feel so bad because I don't want to be late for those teachers and whatever. Instead, what they were now saying was I'm paying for it. They're getting paid. I can, I can be as late as I want. And they actually found people got later and later and later over time. Okay. So that's an example of how monetary incentives can crowd out an, a different motivation. Yeah. Question. I'll wait till we're all done. Okay. Yeah, I can answer questions. But so I, the, my point in this is um, money can change the dynamics of the social system, right? So it can crowd, it can both change your own internal motivations, but it can also change what we've been studying, um, how people think about that behavior as a, as a social system, how the group thinks about that behavior. They might say, wow, if somebody's willing to pay for that, that must be a really important thing to do. Right, which is a strong injunctive norm. It might also lead to lots of people doing it. So then I look around and say, wow, lots of people are doing this. I should do this too, right? So these are these are normative, normative perceptions, my perceptions of what my systems, people in my social system are doing, right? Um, so I've been kind of throwing around some terms here and I wanna just get into a couple of these. Um, social norms, I've been saying this over and over again. I think we have kind of a good idea of generally what a social, if, you, if I just asked you what a social norm is, you have kind of an idea of this, right? Like what people around me are doing, whatever. We, di we distinguish between these two kinds of norms that are very common. There's lots of ways to do this, but we just think about two kinds of social norms. Descriptive norms, that's the prevalence of a behavior in the society, what I see people doing. Okay, so that's the idea. I looked out in my, in that party and was like, nobody's wearing a mask, okay? There's other scenarios where I look out and I see everybody's doing this thing, right? So if you can think about when you walk into a room right now, you look around, you see, is everybody masked or not, okay? Should I put on a mask? And maybe if I see lots of people are doing it, that makes me more likely to do it as well. That's a descriptive norm, right? An injunctive norm is what people think is the right thing to do, what's socially approved, right? What people think you should do, right? So you can think of those two things as what people do and what people think you should do. Sometimes those are the same thing and sometimes they're not, right? So we can think of cases where they're not exactly the same, right? Um, I'm gonna mention some kind of financial incentive stuff here and I won't get deep into these things, but I do wanna mention that we talk about something called behavioral payment programs. And I won't use this word very often, but it's just to distinguish financial incentives that we study from something like a job. Okay, we're not we don't study jobs and how social norms change associated with jobs. We study how when there's some kind of program that is paying people to do some pro-social thing, some good thing like plant trees, get vaccinated, whatever, right? We've had a lot of vaccination, pay vaccination programs in this country recently, okay? How, when you pay, what that looks like when you pay somebody to do those things. And we really focus in on paying that is rewarding rather than taking away the money, punishing, punishing people somehow, or um, providing them with some other kind of non-cash payment, okay? Um, 
in this vein, there's something in the world that is called a payment for ecosystem services program. Is that a term that people have heard of or not? Okay. This is the idea that there's all these programs to try and improve the environment around the world, right? And these are programs where they're paying people to either protect a resource or to improve a resource of some kind, right? So they may be paying people to protect a watershed. They may be paying people to plant trees in an area to secure the soil or to reforest an area, right? Those are payment for ecosystem services programs where people are being paid to do something basically good for the environment. And those are the kind of programs that we study. There's lots of them going on all over the world. China, which we'll talk about today, has some of the biggest programs doing this in the whole world. Um, and those are many of those are around reforestation and um, land use, land cover kinds of issues. And then the last thing here is our the model that we've been working on, which is called the FINS, Financial Incentives and Normative Systems, really dorky, but I'll show you a picture of it. Um, and that's a model that this, this is the basic picture of it. And I'll tell you what it means, so don't get concerned over all too many words up here because there are a lot of words. But this is kind of an overarching conceptual model of how we think about our research. The basic idea here is you can see over here are social norms, right? Our real interest, my real interest is on that side of it, but I have partners who are really interested in all parts of this model. And we're interested in how all these things work together, right? So on this side, we're interested in how social norms influence our decisions and our actions to take an action of some kind, like to wear a mask or not wear a mask. Then we're interested in how those decisions and those actions over time change social norms, right? As people in a system keep doing those behaviors. On the other side of this, we're interested in how people's decisions and actions change the ecosystem, change health systems, change animal health systems, et cetera, and then how that shapes action. So as we see those changes happening, how that then influences our own actions. You can see down at the bottom here, PES, Payment for Ecosystem Services, that comes in like an intervention. Remember, we said we're interested in interventions, communication interventions, financial interventions, right? A PES is a kind of financial intervention into the system that changes the whole system, right? Because it changes the decisions people make potentially, which can then change social norms. It can change the ecosystem. It can change everything, right? So if I start paying people to plant trees, for example, right? It's going to influence their willingness to plant trees, right? Maybe I never ever. And so there's lots of tree planting programs around the world, you can imagine, right? Lots of reasons to plant trees in the world, right? Especially carbon capture, for example, right? So I never ever thought of planting trees in the past, but if you'll pay me to plant trees, I'll plant those trees, right? Once I start planting those trees, it shapes the way people think about tree planting as a behavior, right? Wow, that's, look at lots of people are doing this, right? And this, this is an important thing probably, social, social norms there. It also changes the ecosystem, right? It makes it look greener. It might make our air seem cleaner. I don't know if you've ever ran or walked under a tree versus around pavement, it feels cooler, right? So you have all this immediate kind of ecosystem feedback that might shape later your decisions to keep doing this thing. Cause you're like, cool, we planted a tree, it made it cooler, we'll do it again, right? So this is kind of how we, from this, we derive, derive testable hypotheses and test those, test our predictions from this model. But this is kind of like the big, big idea for the research that we do. So, um, so this work that I'm going to talk about started with what I call experiment zero, which is really what I would, would kick this whole thing off was basically like the rejection study. And how this started was, a group of researchers at MSU, we put together this big grant proposal. So I'm sure you've heard people talking here, you know, part of what we do, some of you are former faculty or current faculty maybe, and you, you know that part of what we do is seek funding for our work, right? Well, we, this group of faculty put together this really great big proposal, it was rejected. And so not unusual, right? Most funding agencies have very low acceptance rates. But we got this little grant from the Sustainable, Sustainable Michigan Endowed Partnership, which is a partnership at MSU, to get the people, the rejected people back together and talk about some of the ideas that we thought were super interesting, which were about financial incentives and social norms. And we used that money to do a little experiment, the rejection experiment, <laughs> that then seed funded the rest of the project that I'm going to talk about. 
this project was an experiment on campus where we looked at how when you incentivize a behavior and then take away that behavior, how that works together with social norms to influence people's decisions, whether or not to contribute to a public good of some kind. Okay, so we were basically trying to study that model, trying to study a little piece of that model. Okay. So what we saw from this research is that um, both incentives and social norms, what we perceive other people are doing, descriptive norms in this case, both shaped people's decisions to contribute to a public good. So if we varied, you know, if we sometimes gave people an incentive and then took it away, if pe those people who were incentivized were more likely to contribute more to a public good project. What we found was um, when you provide that incentive and then take it away, any positive effects of social norms are weakened. So as we were talking about at the beginning, once you start paying people, what happened in this experiment was any good social norms that were in place were eroded. They stopped influencing people's behaviors, right? So that we were like, ooh, that's not very good. Um, we also saw in that that these, this mechanism really occurs when you're really close to a group or you feel very connected to group, a group. So if you're close to a group of people, their social norms are more influential in the decisions that you make. And that's kind of intuitive, right? So your family, if you're close to your family, they have a greater influence on the decisions you make than say your work group or who maybe you're not close to or a social group that maybe you're less close to, right? Well, our data was consistent with that idea. So this spawned a, a series of projects that basically looked at the short-term um, effects of financial incentives on behavior and we we studied these questions in a particular cultural context and you can see can anybody take a guess where we are in this picture you want to take a guess peru nope okay. but close we started in peru one of those pictures we started trying to find a place for this this took a while to find the right place to study this question okay to study these questions where take another guess where could this be um, Big mountain. Oh yeah, look at that letter. What are those letters? Could be anywhere in the world. Okay. It is on the far, I'll show you the picture. Let me go ahead. Yeah, so this is the Qinghai province in China, right? You can see at the very top there, we were or in the uh, Qinghai region in China. We were in the um, Yushu Autonomous Prefecture. That's the red. Okay. And then these are down in the bottom here. These are the counties where we were working. Okay. Um, and I'll show you another map that kind of gives you a better context for this in just a second, if it'll let me go. Can I ask why it's Tibetan? Yes, you can ask why. That's a really good question. It is Tibetan. So China has, and I don't know how much people know about China. You might have a China expert in the room, but the essence is China has something called autonomous regions that are on kind of the outlying areas of China, which are basically places that China has moved into and um, uh, taken control of basically through the years. One of them is this Tibetan region out on the Western side of the country. Another is a place called Inner Mongolia, uh, Northern uh, name Mongo Inner Mongolia, an autonomous region. And then Xinjiang is a region that some of you have probably heard a lot about in the news lately. That is another autonomous region. And so they're named based on the groups of people or something connected to the people who live in that region. So the Tibetan Autonomous Region, this is an area where the local population is largely ethnically Tibetan. Um, so, and we were interested in this particular group for a lot of reasons. And our, our, a lot of our research on social norms studies groups, right? Because norms function at, at kind of the group level. And we're interest, interested in this particular group because they sit kind of on the margins of Chinese society. Um, they are, there's strong conservation norm that's been documented among people who live in this region and who are part of this group. Um, there were also um, relationships that we had already there with people working in this region. And there was also a really strong set of PES programs that were about to be launched, Payment for Ecosystem Services programs that we're be about to be launched in this region. So this, this project is a, a seven or eight year now project that's been going on and still 
like last week, we were publishing more papers that are coming out of this. So this is new research. It's been going on a long time. So there's a lot to it. I'm not going to tell you all about it, uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, but it's been going on a long time. And um, it's really to test that model that I showed you, to test elements of that model. So we were interested in um, testing, understanding whether you could look at social norms in cultural context in this particular region, um, testing the predictions of that model, the picture that I showed you, and trying to translate the findings of our research into things that were meaningful for PES interventions, payment for ecosystem services interventions in this region, and maybe for policy around um, payment for ecosystem services programs. So that's where we worked and have been working and continue to work. This is an important region ecologically for a couple of important a couple of reasons. One is it is the headwaters of the three largest rivers in Asia. The Mekong, the Yangtze, and the Yellow River all sit right in the region where we work. And um, you can see our collaborator in this work is something called Shan Shui Conservation um, Organization. They have study sites all over. You see those little black, um, black flags. Those are their study sites in this region. Um, and their, their whole sort of region working area is this headwaters area. So why are headwaters ecologically important? Why would that matter? What's go, what, it, what is it about headwaters that matter? Source of drinking water. Source of drinking water for billions, literally billions of people downstream, right? That is maybe the biggest reason, right? One of the biggest reasons. It also controls like everything that happens downstream, right? Um, you know, the quality of the water, the flow of the water, everything that goes on downstream, it all starts right there, right? Um, and so whatever happens up there has potential impacts all the way down. So there's a real interest in China in keeping, trying to help preserve the ecology of this area. And um, our project was part of trying to help figure that out by seeing if you can um, shape the decisions that people make around environmental conservation behaviors in that region. Okay. This is a picture of the region. You can see it's gorgeous, but visually gorgeous. It's right in the, it's in the Tibetan plateau. Um, and you can see the mountains all around. Um, and, you know, here's a uh, idyllic scene of yaks or cattle as they're called in the region, grazing on this grassland, which looks lush and amazing, right? You'll see from many of our pictures, a lot of it doesn't actually look very lush and amazing at certain times of the year. And that's a, that's a whole discussion, right? Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we did there and some of the findings that we have. I, I don't have a clock. Oh, is this a working clock over here? There's wow. one behind you. Okay, you I'm good, I'm all right. Um, so first I said, we wanted to understand these um, norms, social norms and cultural context and develop a, a way to try and get at social norms in this cultural context is kind of a step one. We started really far back, which is not something I normally do in my research. Dr. Kaplowitz did not, we did not start this far back when we did research um, for my dissertation, let's just say. Um, but when I, when I got into this particular cultural context, which was very new to me as a researcher and was very new to many of my collaborators, except for my local collaborators, of course, who lived in the region and worked in the region, um, we wanted to start like very backwards at the very beginning and say, okay, how do social norms even look here? Do they look anything like how we've thought about them? Or is there another way of thinking about social norms altogether? I'm not gonna go through like the whole process of that. Don't worry, you're like, oh boy. Okay, <laughs> step one, <laughs> I was born. No, um, so I'm not gonna start right there, but we really did start there, okay? And we started our work really with observation and field visits and conversations with people about the behaviors that are most important to them, to the ecosystem, to um, the life they live every day, right? So we really started at a very observational learning level with field visits and observation, and observation and discussion. It took us a long, long time to hone in on a couple of behaviors of interest. And you know, I've been talking all along about social norms. When you're talking about social norms, you're really talking about the link between what people think in their heads what is right and some kind of behavior. And the behavior is really important. Figuring out, you know, what is the right behavior if you're going to study these things is probably the most critical thing, right? So we spent a lot of time thinking about 
What is a behavior that's interesting from a social norm standpoint? What is a behavior that's important to people in the region? What is a behavior that's important for conservation? What is it be? I mean, okay, you can see all the things, right? It's, it was a lot of things to try and figure out, okay? We settled on, and you're looking at these pictures like, what can this possibly mean? What is this? What do you think we settled on? What could the behaviors be? Take a guess. What are these animals even? They look yeah, kind of crazy in these pictures. <laughs> <laughs> the pictures are like a little bit, were generated in a weird way. Um, that's a snow leopard. It doesn't look very snowy in that picture, but that's a snow leopard, which is an which is a animal that's native to this region. That's a yak. Okay. Right. Both of these are like the iconic things that are all over, you know, that are like kind of like, oh, in this region. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, why do you think they matter from a conservation standpoint? Well, preserving snow leopards, we can figure that out, right? So one of our behaviors was um participating in patrols to reduce poaching of snow leopards. Okay, that was one of the behaviors that we ended up focusing on. Crazy, I know, I didn't think it was going that way, but that's how it went, right? That's research. The other behavior, you'll never guess, but it has to do with yaks. And it's all about how people manage those yaks, how many animals they have, where they graze those animals, how often they graze those animals, whether they move that grazing around, whether they fence their animals, I learned a lot, okay? Because all of those things have implication for the protection of the watershed, right? If the, if the grassland is all blown out around the water, this is simple social science version of this, okay? I hope none of you is like an ecology expert because you're gonna laugh at what I'm about to say. But if the grassland is all blown out around a river, it, allows all kinds of bad things to flow into the river and it doesn't keep the silt intact. It doesn't, it doesn't uphold the sort of natural um, system that's there and ultimately ends up damaging the ecosystem, right? So one way that the grassland gets blown out is those guys over there, yaks, okay? Yaks eat a lot. I don't know if any of you have seen pictures of, you know, mountains in Hawaii or mountains in Peru or mountains in many places you've been, you've probably seen these things. They all have this very, what looks like tightly clipped, crypt glass grass. It is really from grazing animals in many cases on that grass, right? They mow down like everything in their path and yaks are like that. So we focused in on how people were hurting their yaks, how they were managing their yaks because it was a, something that everybody in that region was doing, right? So the folks living there are um, partially nomadic um, pastoralists um, who herd primarily yaks. Okay. The first thing that we did was we had more structured conversations with people. I used to have an engine. Again, you need like a lavalier to be able to move. Had some, had some structured conversations with people, did interviews with people. So our first step of our data collection was 80 interviews with people in four villages about these two topics. Okay. And the purpose of that was to ask some overarching questions. Who are the most influential people? Who are people looking to as they make their decisions about these behaviors, okay? What kinds of information do people use to make decisions about how they herd their animals, about whether to engage, whether to engage in po poaching protection, et cetera? Um, and of course, because I'm a norms researcher, what is the nature of the injunctive and descriptive norms associated with these behaviors? So, um, one thing we were able to do was kind of map what the networks look like around these particular issues, right? And I'm going to focus in on herding behaviors particularly. So what we see from this, um, this data, or what you can see from this picture is in the middle there, you've got herds, their herdsmen, and our sample was all men in this particular study because they were the ones in it most likely to enact these behaviors. In future studies, we include both men and women. But you can see the kinds of people that people are going to for decisions. In this case, this is general advice about herding. Like, who would you go to? Some people went mainly to their family. Other people went to other people who were in their herding group, in-group group, in group herdsmen. Some people went to a village leader. A lot of people really didn't talk to anybody about this. Okay, Those are the people in the middle who weren't connected to anybody. Okay. Then when we look at advice, like if you need advice about what to do about your herd, the, the map looks a little different. 
okay? The leader is kind of the central person. They would go to a leader initially to talk about, I need some advice on what to do. Should I move where I'm hurting? Should I go to a different grassland? Should I herd less animals, whatever, okay? Um, so an, an advice issue. And then we see when we ask people about when you have a problem, where would you go? And you can see totally different, right? So primary person here is a veterinarian in the local community. And then it kind of spreads out and you see government officials, for example, um, come into play as somebody they would go to to ask for help with a problem of some kind, okay? So this is gives gave us an idea of like, number one, who are the people they're talking to, right? About these issues, because that seems kind of simple, but it's real basic. Like, think about who you talk to about different issues, right? If you're having a health issue, who would you talk to? If you're having a problem with your finances, who you who would you talk to? If you just wanted like some general advice on life, who would you talk to, right? These all may be, there might be some commonalities, but there might be different folks who make up that network and you'd go to different people to learn about um, those things. So this gave us a picture of that, okay? And it also gave us a sense of just how central certain people or um, uh, entities were to people's decision-making. So you see here a vet, um, they're really central in the case of problems, okay? If I was, and this is just, we didn't do this, but you could do this, and this is done commonly in research. If I wanted to reach all those people and I had this picture, I would know, go to the vet, right? It, this gives you a sense of if you're trying to reach out to people in some way about an issue, like a problem with animal herding or whatever, whatever the problem is, it could be anything. We do this for all kinds of behaviors. You go to the vet in this case, right? But this network looks different depending on the issue, depending on the topic, okay? We also wanted to know what information people use as the basis for their decision about herding behaviors. And what we saw were a couple of things. One is they look directly to the ecology, okay? So they look around to the ecology and see, how does, how does my grassland look, right? Does it look healthy? Does it not look healthy? What's the weather like, right? Can it sustain the kinds of behaviors that I'm doing? That makes sense, right? So if you think about any agricultural provider or anybody who has to rely on the land to make you know, choices about their like livelihood, they have a good sense of the ecology and what's going on in the ecology. We also saw, and this is one of my favorite pictures that we've ever taken in this region in the middle, these are basketball playing monks, okay? <laughs> we also saw that spirituality played an important role in people's decisions about yaks. And in particular, there's this concept of samsara, which is basically the idea that life comes in around, what comes around goes around basically, right? Life continues the cycle of life, right? So the idea that you may be you this time around, but next time around, you're gonna be a yak, right? right. Or maybe you're gonna be a snow leopard, right? Or maybe you're going to be a dung beetle or something, right? I hope not, right? Um, but we saw people talking explicitly about how their decisions about their herds and how they manage their herds, when they sell them, when they slaughter them, how they make decisions about feeding, et cetera, in part, that was based on their spiritual beliefs and their discussions with spiritual leaders about um, what to do, okay? We also, um, the picture at the top doesn't exactly represent this, but we also saw the market playing a significant role in people's decisions, not surprisingly, right? How, do I make a decision about how many yaks I can sustain based on how many yaks I'll ultimately be able to make money off of, how many um, people I have to help me navigate, you know, to watch my yaks, et cetera, um, whether I need to hire somebody, and nobody there's really hiring somebody, but whether I keep my kids out of school to help me um, manage my yaks, et cetera, right? There were financial or market decisions that also played a significant role in these decisions. And then the last um, picture here is the group, okay, at, which was good because I was worried that... I mean, it was possible, right? We're interested in social norms, we're interested in social groups, but we weren't sure that people were gonna say, you know, I look to my group members, I look to the people in my herding group, my family members, et cetera. But indeed people talked about how they, you know, they would make their decisions about herding and about um, poaching protection based on what their family thought was the right thing to do, what their family was doing, et cetera, okay? Um, and the last thing that we looked at in these interviews is what, 
sorts of information we found about descriptive and injunctive norms. And this is just some quotes from people. This is um, and the kind of summary of what they know about the descriptive norm for how many animals, what people are doing with their animals, how many animals they have, how they're managing the grassland is basically, I know what people in my village are doing. I know what people in my own herding group, people in this region herd in groups, I know what they're doing. But beyond that, I don't really know what people are doing, right? So my sense of, and this is because it, you can't tell from that picture, but this is a gigantic region, okay? So, um, so even villages are very big. So they don't have a lot of opportunities to interface with, with people from outside of their village. So a lot of their knowledge of what's normative, what's normal, right? What's typical behavior comes from just the people right in their village group, right? Um, and so these are just some quotes that you can read of, that kind of describes this, okay? And what sorts of, the first one is really about, we only raise yaks here. It used to be that we had sheep, we had goats, we had horses, we had all these different animals. Now it's just only yaks, okay? And um, then the next point is about how many yaks people have, because this is a whole question of sustainability, right? So some, you know, every person can have at least 20 yaks based on some policies, um, but if it's insufficient, um, more yaks will be purchased, or if it's not sustainable, they will get rid of their animals. Okay, these are just examples of the descriptive norm. Um, the injunctive norms that we saw can be kind of summarized by this idea of harmony, majority rules, and the llamas or the spiritual leaders have a lot of kind of power in terms of injunctive norms. But they're the ones who are most likely to say, this is the right thing to do, or this is the wrong thing to do. They're much more likely to say that. And you can maybe generalize that to other societies where religious leaders might be more likely to say, you should be doing this, you shouldn't be doing this, right? That's where a lot of our normative information comes from. Indeed, we see the same thing in this case, okay? Um, so the harmony idea was people would talk to each other about what's okay, what's the right thing to do, what we can agree on, right? Um, and agree with what everybody else says we should do, okay? If everybody thinks we should, you know, stop herding in this region because of the fact that the grasslands, you know, being degraded there, then I'll go along with what the majority says. And that's not something we see. We do studies of norms all over the place. Not everywhere are people willing to say, I'll just go along with what everybody does. Indeed, in the United States, people are loath to say that. Okay, um, they do it, but they're low to say that I'll go along with what everybody does, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I think that kind of makes that point. So, yeah. All right, so I want to be kind of respectful of our tenure. So we use that data to develop quantitative measures of the things we were interested in. So we use the interview data to shape uh, quantitative measures, quantitative measures about the things of interest, and we. Um, conducted some experiments to test the model that I showed you. Again, there were a series of experiments. Some of them were about whether or not you'd be willing to join an ecosystem services program that meant you had to reduce the number of yaks you were herding. Okay, so that was one of some of the experiments looked at that. Um, so, um, and this is common that people will be paid to reduce the number of animals they're herding because it will herding them. H-E-R-D, herding, because it will reduce the impact on the ecosystem. You can see that connection there, right? If, if you herd fewer animals, the ecosystem's better off, right? So it's common to pay people to reduce the number of animals that they're herding. Just like in this country, it's common to pay, pay, pay agricultural producers to let part of their land go to conservation in order to protect the ecosystem in that region, okay? Um, we also did some experiments where we tried to understand how willing people would be to give their time to patrol for trapping and poaching. So actually going out and looking for people who are poaching for snow leopards and also going out and removing traps in the system. Okay, so we one of our dependent measures was how many days would you be willing to give to do this? Okay, so what we did a bunch of experiments um, based on all the data to try and learn about those elements of that model and test some of the elements of that model. And what we see from those experiments are a couple of interesting things. And they're different from what we saw in um, our data in, in that experiment zero, our what we call our um, rejection experiment. Um, but what we see in this data, what we see, what we saw in our study was that perceived norms, what we think is normative and what we think is the right thing to do 
changes as behaviors around us change. So we observed in these experiments, we had people in groups and they were either agreeing to take contribute um, days, contribute their time or willing to join this, um, join this uh, herd reduction program, okay? And what we saw is as we observed people doing those behaviors, our perceptions of what's normative changed along with those behaviors. That's kind of intuitive, right? But it, it hadn't been documented, right? All that means is when I look around and I see people doing things, I perceive, okay, yeah, people are doing those things, right? And I also start thinking, wow, this must be important, right? Injunctive norms. Um, we also saw that incentives and social norms both had direct effects on people's decisions to do these things. That is, if other people were doing it, and if other people, if I was told that other people say this is important, I was also willing to do that thing, right? Um, even controlling for every other thing that we could think of, Stan, okay? Controlling for, for all the other variables in a regression model, though you guys don't care about that, but controlling for those things, we could see that those things had direct effects on people's decisions. Incentives had a direct effect on people's decisions. Not surprisingly, if you're gonna pay people and as the size of the incentive goes up, they get more willing, okay, up to a point, then it seems to not matter as much. But if you're going to pay people to do something, they're more willing to do that thing. That's surprisingly. I ask people like, if I stop paying you to do your job right now, would you keep doing your job? And unless you're a professor, <laughs> everybody to, to a T is like, I would stop doing my job right now, right? Most professors are like, oh, well, you know, I might keep doing it for a few years, right? I used to always say, if I won the lottery, I'd just keep doing my job, right? Because it's fun. Um, <laughs> okay, so we see that. What we also see is that in this data, when the incentives end, people largely stop doing the behavior, okay? And if there had been a positive social norms, a positive social norm, that kind of social norm, the effects of that norm kind of eroded over time. But what we also saw that was kind of interesting was that by incentivizing something, that made people think, wow, this is an important thing, okay? So this is something that's really critical. When people get paid to do something pro-social like this, that signals to people, this must be important. People around me must think this is really important, okay? And that's a good outcome of incentives, right? I'm gonna, I've kind of talked about some damaging things of incentives, right? If you pay people, then you take the money away. They're not gonna do it anymore and you've ruined all their goodwill and their other motivations and all these things. That can happen, but it can also signal that, wow, this is an important thing to people. And if somebody's willing to pay for this, maybe I should do this too, right? Um, so, and that can continue over time, even after the incentives end, okay? Strong, and that's the last point here, right? Mm -hmm. Strong social norms, if you can foster strong social norms for a behavior, here, that can support those behaviors once the incentives end. So if you have a case and the, the money is likely to go, continue once the money disappears. I'll figure out how to work this thing someday. So based on that, we revised our thinking about this altogether. I'm not gonna get into this. But the other thing that we did was we used all of this data to develop, this is basically a policy brief. Okay, um, to develop a little brief about if you're going to use incentives to promote in ecosystem services programs, here's some tips. Here's some ways that you can do it so that you don't inadvertently crowd out, right? Crowd out the good motivations that people have, but still um, incentivize them to want to do these things. And then once that money goes away, they'll still want to do those things potentially, right? So this was um, a policy brief that we created. We shared it with people who do um, develop ecosystem services programs in China, where our work was, um, but also in, Be in Beijing, where there's programs going on all over the country. And we've also shared these findings with people who develop these programs in the United States and other places as well. Because these kinds of programs are so common, um, I mean, they're used to you know, get, get people to do all kinds of behaviors in the, around the world. Um, it's important that we do them right, right? It's important that if you're if you start paying, you're you're really changing the economic system. Obviously, when you start 
infusing a bunch of money into it, right, by paying people to do things. But what our research shows is you're also changing the social system, right? And if you're going to do that, you want to be very thoughtful about how you do that. Right? And so this was a, a brief to try and um, show how to do this, okay? And then we also, you can see these are some goofy pictures. So on the top, this is our team. One thing that we did as part of this research, we worked with our um, the nonprofit Shan Shui Conservation Center. Their interest in this was having their staff trained on social research methods. They wanted to have staff who were able to conduct interviews, who were able to conduct surveys. They didn't want to know how to do experiments, but they wanted to know how to be, how to learn how to collect data to inform the programs that they do. So we did a bunch of work training them on how to, how to use informed consent, how to develop good measures of things, how to ask, you know, how to develop an interview protocol, et cetera. And that's a picture of us doing that up there in the corner. Um, this is a picture here of one of the trainings we did where we talked about that policy brief and some of the recommendations that we had for how to do payment for ecosystem services programs. And then in the bottom, that is our collaborator teaching me how to sing Taylor Swift 22 at the karaoke bar. And I'm telling you, it was bad. Those, Taylor Swift is hard to sing karaoke in case you ever want to try. So um, yeah, so all right. So takeaway points and then I'm done and then we'll take questions. Um, I've talked a lot about a lot of stuff up here, but the essence of all this is what people around us do and what they think is important can shape what we do, right? And you can think about your own actions and when you've looked to other people to help make a decision. Um, and sometimes that's good and sometimes it's bad. We can just leave it at that, right? There's cases where what people around us are doing are bad things <laughs> and we do those things. Um, and there's cases around cases where people are doing good things or think good things are the thing to do and that shapes our behavior and that's good, right? So it's sometimes for good, sometimes for evil. Um, we know that paying people to do something pro-social is happening all over the world and it can be done in a way that is not necessarily damaging to the social system or the um, economic system potentially, um, but it has to be done in a, in a careful way, I guess I'd say. Um, and that's because incentives can both crowd out and reinforce other kinds of motivation. They can crowd out your own motive, your own personal motivations. They can crowd out social motivations like social norms. And so knowing how to best talk about those incentives, where, who developed them, where they came from, what the basis of those incentives is, and also to talk about social norms, that's an important way to figure out how to use these, um, use incentives. And then the last thing I'll say, um, we a lot of these studies, I didn't really get into it, but they had a time element to them. So we were looking at these processes, not at one point in time, but over time. Um, and so we were able to kind of track the evolution of social norms in these experiments. And we've been able to track the evolution of social norms during COVID. We've been able to track the evolution of social norms in, in, various, um, in various different health behaviors. Um, it's very interesting to try and understand that process because it really shapes, it shapes what people do, right? So because social norms pay, play a role in the decisions people make, understanding them and how they evolve over time can help us understand ultimately the decisions people are going to make around like wearing a mask or around getting a vaccine or whatever the behavior is. Okay. So with that, I will stop um, and take any questions. Um, there's a Zen or Zen last picture, and yes, question. Was there were a cooperative like structure that affected up the supply in the marketplace that influenced the decisions that these people were making that controlled it to some extent beyond norm? Yes, we that's a great question. Repeat the question. Yes, so the question is Was there a cooperative like structure that influenced the decisions that people made? beyond the norm? That's a really good question. And the answer is yes. So I alluded to it a little bit in that um, they have this area has something called herding groups and collective herding. And so this is a long, I'm going to do a short answer to this, but basically that was something we learned on the ground as we were there, sort of what the nature of those collectives were. And all of our questions asked about that group structure. And all of our discussions talked about that group structure. And so there's complexities here. One is the nature of those groups. The other complexity is policies, which I didn't even touch. Policies about collective hurting, collective decision-making, et cetera, right? And that influenced the kind of decisions people made as well. So yes, um, thank you for that question. 
Um, we almost at one point thought, is there even a point in studying social norms because there's so many policies connected to this kind of collective hurting and there's all these um, policies that restrict decision making, not surprisingly maybe, but restrict decision making among people in terms of what they're able to, how much leeway they have to make changes to their hurting practices, et cetera. Um, because you know there's limits on how many animals they can herd, there's limits on what the collective can do, et cetera. But what we discovered was there are there was still tremendous variability in the numbers of animals people were herding, how they were using their land, um, how they, all the things that we were interested in, and that they were actually engaged in regular discussions about kind of negotiating that. So yeah, good question. Thank you. Other questions or thoughts or yeah. Taz is going to monitor the chat. So far, we just have a comment on the recycling section you talked about. But are there questions in the room? Yeah. Yes, there are. Oh. Oh. Well, I'm going to defer to Stan. Oh, OK. Go ahead, Stan. So, uh, I'm thinking back to COVID and vaccination and attempts to get people to do that. And you know, I probably recall uh, there were Sometimes in places where people were being given uh, very tangible incentives to get vaccinated. Yeah. It, it, it got some people to be vaccinated, but it certainly did, did not get rid of the, the resistance. I'm wondering if you could add, have any other insights on that as to when they, when they like obviously had a political party which was increasingly advertising. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so the question is about um, incentivizing vaccination, which was a program that occurred in the United States and has incurred it, occurred in other places. It's occurred at the state level, it's occurred in companies, it's occurred at whatever, it's happening in a lot of different places. Um, you know, I guess my the short answer would be, and you know, I would say this is um, I think there was so much um, uh, so much anti-vaccination information and noise that was occurring at the same time as those incentive programs. And many of those incentive programs were not um, rolled out in a way that was attentive to social dynamics or social norms or what we know about communication. That it's my answer to that would be there probably would have been a better way to <laughs> roll out those programs. I hate to say that. Um, and I've really, um, as somebody, even though I study this and it's kind of right in my wheelhouse, I didn't work on any of those incentive programs. So I don't really have the right to kind of back, back channel, bad mouth those, of course. Um, but um, I think there were probably ways to um, shape the normative conversation connected with the, like our, our research would show you want to boost attitudes toward the behavior or you want to boost normative perceptions associated with the behavior or whatever if you're going to use financial incentives number one number two you want to frame incentives in a way that's going to be most likely to promote the functional outcome that you desire okay we haven't even talked yet about so we paid people to get covid shots when are we going to start paying people to get flu vaccines, when are we gonna start paying people to blah? When are we gonna start paying people to you know, vaccinate their children? Once you start paying people to do something, right? You have the potential that people are gonna just always expect that, right? So there are ways to um, both create the financial incentive system and change the way that those are um, communicated to people and shared with people that can reduce the likelihood that those sort of dysfunctional outcomes are likely to happen. I've looked at some of the studies on those incentive programs and they did increase vaccination rates. There were initially they thought, no, these aren't going to work, but there's been some studies subsequently that show that they did indeed work. And it's, you know, this is a fast moving literature, so there could be something new. So don't, I looked at it a couple months ago. The COVID literature is like, bam, COVID social literature is like, bam, 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 like literally every day, there's thousands of studies coming out. Um, but there is data that shows they did work to increase vaccination rates, right? Um, you know, and I haven't evaluated the quality of that data, but anyway, but no, your question is a good one. You know, the answer, and I don't know, maybe you have a good answer to that question. No. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a complex, there's no like 
you know, in communication theory, there used to be something called the magic bullet theory. That is, you know, we just shoot out information and you take it in passively and everything's great, right? That was like communication a thousand years ago. That's how we thought about it, right? But now we know that that communication process is very complex, right? I Sure, you can send out information about incentives or social norms or whatever, but then when it comes to how people understand that information, there's a lot of complexities to it, right? And this is a case where there was complexities way before, <laughs> in this country particularly, um, before vaccines even came part of the conversation, right? So yeah, great. Another question here. Well, so I'm kind of new to this concept of crowding out the, like crowding out the incentives to-, to Crowding out your motivations for doing the behavior, okay. yeah. So I'm still kind of lost in this. You, and maybe it's because I'm seeing two groups. There's a group that's already doing exactly what you want, ba -da, ba -da, ba -da, and the neighbor is not. So now you put money in. And both of them get money, right? The people potentially who have all yes. Long been doing this. Potentially yes. Um, yeah. Because you can't vaccine you vaccine can't system. say no. You don't get any money. Yeah. And I'll give you. Let me give you just a quick example. Keep hold your thought. But we work with the Carter Center. I don't know if you know. Well, you know our former president Jimmy George. Carter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the Carter Center uses financial incentives to um, incentivize people to report guinea worm cases in. A bunch of countries. Okay. Guinea worm, they're trying. One thing the Carter Center does is it tries to eradicate diseases or at least address neglected tropical diseases. So, in that case, they, you know, there were people who were already reporting guinea worm cases. They came in and said, hey, if people, they, they thought the final push was if we can really incentivize people to report these cases, we can wipe this disease out. So they came in and said, hey, if you report cases, we'll pay you to report those cases. So now everybody's getting paid. Okay, so go to your question. Uh, okay. Whether they whether they, whether they they thought it was a good behavior or they thought it was a bad so behavior. So when you remove the incentive, the people who have always been doing this are the Assuming they also got paid, they don't continue. They, they may or may not continue. Can you restate right? that? Yeah. So she's asking when you've got. So this is a really good question and really important because this is part of the complex dynamics here. You've got people. So a lot of our experiments use what's called a minimal groups paradigm, where you're starting with nobody's ever done this thing, nobody's ever, you know, they, nobody has any history with this, nobody has any history with the people who are there. Right. So we don't have to worry about that question in some of the studies that we've done. In some of the studies we've done, we do have to worry about the question. And the question is, when you've got some people who are doing a behavior and some people who are not doing a behavior, then you start incentivizing the behavior. Everybody gets that incentive. Then when you take away the incentive, what happens? Okay. And what you see is you've kind of wrecked, oftentimes you've kind of wrecked everybody. Right. So the child care center example is a good example where there were people who were coming to get their kids on time and there were people who were coming late. So they started paying people, don't come, don't come late, don't come, you know, if you come late, you're sorry, uh, charging. punishing, yeah. charging people, don't come later, we'll charge you. And when they started that, more and more people started coming late. And I, I don't know the data on whether it was only people who uh, hadn't come late before or what, right? But Ultimately, that kind of wrecked, changed everybody's motivation because what we think happens is you turn this into an economic transaction rather than a social transaction, right? So you've turned something that was, I feel bad because I'm showing up late to the child care center, or I feel bad because I'm inconveniencing you in some way or whatever. Now it's become, it's an economic trans transaction, right? I'm paying you. So, you know, you're making money off of this. So what's the big deal? right? With incentives, similar kind of thing. You've turned something that was originally motivated by maybe your health beliefs, your fear of a disease, your concern about the environment, whatever. Now you've turned this into an economic idea in people's head, a transaction in people's head. And, you know, there's not a lot of long-term data on this, like say in large communities or whatever, but the potential is that once you pull that money away, people who now are accustomed to getting paid to do this thing are going to just stop doing this thing. And there's experiments that show this, right? Okay. So now I'm thinking about. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. 
um, how things have gotten sizes that are basically decisions we make because we see them as being in our self best interest. Say when I have an appliance that dies, I'm going to go in and look for the one that uses the what's the I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go for the one that is um, yeah kindest to the environment and costs me less per. Uh, yes. Um, how did, you know that got snuck in there somehow? But it is my decision making process because it's an incentive, not necessarily mm -hmm. financial, but in my self best interest. Um, you can help bring me finish what it is I'm trying to ask. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So she's asking about cases where, um, and there's lots of cases. So I guess what you're highlighting is an example of this. One example of um uh financial incentive for maybe there's i'm actually working on a project right now with consumers energy um and so consumers energy has a lot of um incentives for good ecological behavior right nonetheless people still don't take advantage of those it's like some of them some people don't take advantage of those incentives or they um they do and then when those incentive goes away, they may or may not continue those behaviors, right? So when you really start thinking about the nature of incentive, so we focused only on behavioral payment programs. That's cases where you're paying somebody, like outright paying them to do something. But there's lots of ways we incentivize good behavior, right? Um, you know, we give our kids M&Ms for going potty. We um, give our students an A for showing up to class. We whatever, right? You may give them, well, you don't give them an A for doing that, but you might give them extra credit for showing up to something, right? Um, and Energy Star ratings are an example of that, where you're getting an incentive. There's all kinds of incentives in place. You may get you know, a financial incentive because you save money by using less energy. You might actually be able to write it off in some way or get a, a rebate of some kind. Um, and right now there's lots of these kind of things in place. Um, so yeah, you'll. I think once you start thinking about these incentives, you'll see there's a lot of them for different kinds of behaviors in the world. So there's lots of places to study this. Yeah. Taz, you have two questions in the chat. Would you start with Dr. Waller's question? Yes, of course. Dr. Waller asks, to what extent did agreeing to reduce herd size reflect changing social and or moral norms? And to what extent a decline in the number of people who could be seen to be profiting from the sacrifice of others? In other words, did some people become more likely to reduce their herd size only when they saw that others were not taking advantage of those um, with fewer yaks? I, I think I understand the question. So the question I think is, is, is this primarily a social motivation or an incentive-based motivation? Is that I think so, yeah, that's what I gathered from um, the start. Yeah, I mean, we saw that both of those things mattered and we see this kind of repeatedly. And in some of our studies, we show the social, um, uh, the social elements of this make more of a difference than the incentive based elements. And that was actually in this particular population where the incentive was less powerful than the social motivation. Um, but what we're we're also interested in is how those two things work together, right? Can social norms increase the influence of an incentive, right? If I see the good social norm, does that enhance the influence of an incentive? And that's what we've we've seen that in some experiments as well. So there's both a direct influence of those things. And in some cases, one is more powerful than the other um, in our decisions. And then also those two things work together. That is by just simply seeing um, uh, other people do this action, combining that with an incentive that influences my decision. I hope that answered your question, Dr. Waller. The second question in the chat asks, is Alfie Cohen's punished by rewards obsolete or is it still valid? Alfred Cohen's punished by rewards obsolete or is it still valid? That's a good question. Can you elaborate on that? Maybe we can give that person the opportunity to talk. Is that possible? Kathy and Joel, do you want to unmute and, and state a little bit more about your issue, your uh, question? El Elfie Cohen was a uh, Harvard uh, professor who showed how parents, when they rewarded their children with the wrong incentives, stymied their, their uh, 
academic abilities rather than the rewards backfired and didn't 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 work and many of them were financial yeah and the answer is that obsolete the question is is that obsolete yes or is it still valid oh i feel like our research just reinforces that i mean the what we're seeing what we see in our research is that you you can reward people right but you have to do it very carefully and selectively and under the right set of conditions and one of the things we did for the carter center was we tried to figure out what the right parameters were for rewarding people to do the behaviors that they wanted them to do, right? Um, so, so I think no, I think that that those original ideas were very much are, are very much still borne out by our research and research that's been going on for years. That's a great question. Great. Thank you. Other questions or yeah, you brought up because you're working with consumers. And it occurs to me that I regularly get something from them that says, here's how your house yes. usage compares. <laughs> I have nothing them. to do with those, just so you know. <laughs> but that is to, I don't know. Those are social norms. Or yep. yeah. the norms or whatever. Yep. And I am taking the um, vantage point of the people who say I'll pay to bring my um, my child, to pick up my child when I'm ready to pick up my child because of the background of my house and the things that I changed and why I changed them. I don't want to go to more energy saving. I'm trading sunlight for, um, you know, that kind right. of thing. But it is meant to, it is meant to change my behavior. It sure mm -hmm. is, yeah. And it's so funny because- I feel like I'm not the norm because, you know, before I started getting this, we were always told, oh, we were doing a great job and da da da, -da. we always had the inspection. But now I get these things that say, here's where most houses are and here's where you are. Yeah, and so this is not related to those, but this is funny. So she's talking about consumers energy has, she's asking the question, consumers energy has these home energy reports that are tailored, we call that message tailoring, mm -hmm. tailored to your home's energy use. And it says, your house is doing this. Other energy, other houses like your house in your neighborhood are doing this or like your house. I don't know if it says in your neighborhood. I should have put a picture of those up here. No, that is a blatant descriptive appeal to descriptive norms, right? It's saying, look, hey, look what everybody around you is doing. Okay, I don't have anything to do with those for the record, but it is an appeal to descriptive yeah. norms. Mm -hmm. um, but what she's also bringing up is that um, there's other things that are driving her decision about those. And she didn't say this, but what it prompted me to think about is one thing that we study is how sometimes seeing that information can make you feel guilty or it can make you feel angry or it can make you feel abstinent or, re, you know, sort of re, um, retrench in on your own position on this issue, right? So we have done research that shows how you craft those messages is really important because you can cause people to feel negative emotions. You can cause them to feel positive emotions, right? Which is what you want to do. Um, like, oh, I'm so good. I'm, you know, whatever. I'm just like other people or I'm better than other people maybe or whatever. Um, right. So um, it kind of highlights that, you know, some of my students have done research on this question of when you provide people with normative information, what are the what are the emotions that you elicit from them? And we didn't get into really talking about that. But Can yeah. they send it to everybody regardless of your usage? Because I, I don't recall. I do not know that. I don't know that. And I don't this. It, we are just kicking this project off with them. And I actually think we're going to work not on those home, home energy reports, but on electric vehicle usage issues. Yeah. So I've been le learning more about electric vehicle charging yeah. issues than I have about those home energy reports. I I what, what I recall is that somebody has found that often it would work on people who use more than the average, but sometimes it has the opposite. When you tell people that they use less energy than the average, some of them, some of them are think great and others backslide. Why do I need to be better than average? Yeah, I yeah. It's State possible that people who get them, maybe people who have um, succeeded to having a home energy audit in the recent past, and so they say, having done that, here's, we now have been invited into your life to make these uh, comparisons. I don't know. If you've never gotten one, maybe you haven't had a home energy audit. I haven't, because I felt like I, I knew that. That's why I got one 30 years ago. I felt yeah, like I yeah. knew everything. 
So, well, so there's a discussion here about the home energy audit and whether they're effective or not that I won't repeat because I think we're it's time for us to wrap up. It is indeed. Okay. Thank you, so, Maria. Yeah, so thanks, much. thanks for having me. Thanks to you on the Zoom. We're delighted okay, that everyone joined over. us. <laughs> thank and you. thank you so much. And thank you, Taz, for taking the uh, lead on getting those questions answered. I'd like to remind everybody that next week, which is Tuesday, April 26th, we will have Professor Leo Zulu joining us from Geography, Environment, and Spatial Sciences. He studies the relationship between people and environments in Africa. He's worked on deforestation and food security, community-based natural resource management, and the vulnerability and adaption of rural communities in Southern Africa to climate change. That is a timely topic. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you again. Good night. Thank you.